Hello, gentlemen, and welcome to your video on Chapter 1, Section 2, entitled States of Matter, Solid, Liquid, and Gas. Now, one of the key components of your investigation was to make great observations. It was a simple investigation. It was simply taking ice and watching it change form or change its state of matter. And you guys did that, but the key was to make great observations and use an analytical scientific thinking approach to excavate meaning from that data, although it was a very simple experiment. Now, when we talk about observations, there are two types of observations that we can take. One type is called qualitative. A qualitative observation is a description, or well, a descriptive observation using words. For example, saying it's cold outside. Another type of observation is a quantitative observation, and this is a numerical description that's based on measurement. So instead of saying it's cold, which is qualitative, quantitative is saying it's 25 degrees Fahrenheit outside. It still means the same thing, but you're putting a number to it rather than a general descriptive statement. Both are valid forms of observation or description, describing your observations. In your investigate, we looked at the characteristics of the phases. Characteristics meaning we observed the shape, the volume, and the particle movement of water. Now, when we also talked about this in your what do you think part of the investigation. So, <clears throat> some things that we might find or that we did investigate and look at is a solid. We said it has a definite shape, meaning its shape doesn't change when you put a solid into a different container. For example, if I put this marker, which is a solid, into this beaker, it didn't change its shape. The shape is definite. It had a definite volume, meaning the volume of this marker, the space that this marker takes up, did not change when it entered a different environment. It stayed the same. Even though the molecules or particles that <clears throat> make up a solid have slight vibrations and they are tightly packed together. A liquid has an indefinite shape, meaning its shape can change. A liquid takes the shape of its container. If I were to put liquid water into this beaker, it would take the shape of the beaker. If I were to pour it flat on the table, it would take the shape of the table. A liquid has an indefinite shape, meaning it takes the shape of its container. But it has a definite volume. If I put 20 milliliters of water in here, and I poured it into a cup, that cup, no matter how large or small that cup was, it would contain 20 milliliters of water. If I put 20 milliliters of water that were in here into a different cup, it would not expand to 50 milliliters of water just because the cup was that big. So liquid has a definite volume, and the particles are loosely packed, and they're flowing past each other. They're moving slightly faster than if they were in a solid. Next, a gas. Gases have an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume, meaning gases take the shape of their container, and gases expand to the volume of their container, or they get compressed to the volume of their container. So gases are compressible. Liquids and solids are not compressible. Their volume does not change, but a gas's volume can change. Now the particles in a gas are spread very far apart and they're moving very rapidly. They're colliding with one another. <clears throat> now, we can sum this up with a little diagram here. Here we have solids. Solids are densely packed together, liquids flowing past each other, gases spaced very far apart, moving rapidly. This happens as we increase heat energy towards the substance. In your investigation, this was an example of ice going to liquid water, going to water vapor. And this happened as we added heat energy to the beaker. As we added heat energy, we saw that the temperature was rising. Now, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of molecules. So what is kinetic energy, first off, before we talk about the average kinetic energy? Kinetic energy <clears throat> depends on speed. And those guys who have physics, you know that kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And it's defined as one-half the mass times the square of the velocity. So the main component is the velocity here. We know that particles all have mass, and they have some speed to them. The higher the speed, the more kinetic energy they have. Temperature is a reading of that. So when you're reading a thermometer, you're really reading 
an output value of the average kinetic energy of molecules. Now, this is supported by the kinetic molecular theory, which states that all molecules and atoms are in constant motion. So everything is at some temperature. There isn't anything that's existing in the world that is just motionless. At that point, we call it um, the point of absolute zero, which is at zero Kelvin, which we'll talk about later on, or negative 273 degrees Celsius, which we haven't reached yet. Some theorize that it's impossible to reach. Now, <clears throat> phase changes occur, which is solid, liquid, and gases, because the energy that is added to the substance weakens the attractive forces between the molecules. So let's picture a solid. Those particles are compact, bound together, very attracted to one another. As you add heat energy in, they begin to vibrate, and they vibrate more and vibrate more. The temperature that you read is increasing. That means the average kinetic energy is increasing. That means the velocity of those particles is increasing. As it continues to vibrate and vibrate and vibrate, eventually they start to break loose from each other, meaning the attractive forces are weakening because of the rapid movement. And this happens from solid to liquid to gases. So gases are moving so fast, the particles are moving so fast past each other, that they can't really feel the attraction to one another anymore. And this process is a physical change. So changing in states are changes in physical properties, not chemical properties. So water is still water. It doesn't change and become something different, as it would in a chemical reaction. But H2O as ice becomes H2O as liquid. It becomes H2O as water vapor as heat energy is added and the kinetic energy and the average kinetic energy in the substance increases. Now, a little <clears throat> summation of what we just talked about. Solids go to liquids, go to gases. The process by which this happens are outlined here in purple. A solid becomes a liquid through a process called fusion. We also call that melting. A liquid becomes a gas by a process of vaporization. Some people might say evaporation. Now, the opposite way around, a gas becomes a liquid through the process of condensation, going this direction. A liquid becomes a solid by solidification, also known as freezing. Those are the common ones that we talk about mostly. Now, there are two others that aren't as common. A solid goes directly to a gas, bypassing the liquid phase through a process called sublimation. And a gas goes directly to a solid, bypassing the liquid phase through a process called deposition. Now, let's focus on solid to liquid to gas for water. Now, this is a heating curve of water. This is the graphical representation of the transformation of ice to water, to water vapor. Now we use this <clears throat> for different substances. We use a heating curve for different substances to just talk about the different melting and boiling points that a su different substances have. So let's start here looking at the axes that we have here. So on my y-axis, or axis, excuse me, I have temperature measured in degrees Celsius. On my x-axis, I have heat energy being added. This will be measured in uh, joules, but we don't have to think about that right now. So we first started out with a beaker full of ice. Ice is a solid. We started heating this ice up. As this graph goes to the right, you can think of heat energy being added, meaning that beaker is on the hot plate. As we did that, temperature started to rise, represented by this positive sloped line here. That is temperature increasing. We went from some negative temperature, ice being a solid usually is at a negative temperature, probably in laboratory is negative one at, at the most, but it's at a negative temperature, and as we put it on the hot plate, and as just heat from the air hit this ice, it started to melt. Ice melts at zero degrees Celsius. This is the normal melting point of ice. Now... 
Normal melting point means it's at a pressure of one atmosphere. An atmosphere is just a unit of pressure. One atmosphere is atmospheric pressure, which basically means the pressure at sea level. So at sea level, ice will melt at zero degrees Celsius. If you're at a different pressure or a different elevation, then it will be slightly different than zero degrees Celsius. So <clears throat> ice rises in temperature once it hits zero degrees Celsius at normal or at one atmosphere of pressure, we go through the process of fusion. This is my phase change at this point here. This flat plateau is my phase change. And then, at this point, this solid is all liquid. So after it's all melted, we hit this point, temperature rises again, and I have another positive slope. Then I reach this point here, and I get to 100 degrees Celsius. For water, this is the normal boiling point of water at one atmosphere. This is the point at which water will start to boil. When water boils, we call that process vaporization. It's going from a liquid to a gas. And this long plateau here is that phase change of liquid changing into a gas, or we call water vapor. And then this gas will superheat and become hotter and hotter and hotter, looking as steam. And eventually, if it becomes hot enough, we call it plasma. But we probably won't get there. Um, <clears throat> in this class anyways. Now, the normal boiling point, let's talk about that a little bit. As we change elevation, the boiling point will change. So as you increase your elevation, you become into a, you go into a pressurous atmosphere that has pressure lower than one atmosphere. And when that happens, water boils at a lower boiling point. So in laboratory, you might have had your water boil at around 89 or maybe 90 something degrees Celsius and not quite 100 degrees Celsius. That's because we are at a level higher than sea level, which is, has a pressure of one atmosphere. Now, <clears throat> if we look at the slopes here, all these slopes, you know, one, two, three slopes, we see that the temperature is rising as we add heat energy. But if we look at the plateaus, which are the flat lines, we have two of them, we notice that we're staying constant at zero degrees Celsius, and we're staying constant at 100 degrees Celsius for that plateau. My question is, we're still adding energy through this entire process, even during the plateaus. We're still adding heat energy, but there is no rise in temperature. The question is why? So, in addition to writing these notes, think about why and come to class prepared to answer that question. Also, think about this. Why is the second plateau much longer than the first plateau? Is my second plateau, this is much longer than my first plateau. Think about those two questions, come to class prepared with these notes, and maybe answer to those questions.